hold you accountable for. So I, I want to make sure that there's not a moral hazard issue here. Uh, if you have that question, who should you ask? Who should you email? Yes. So don't hesitate to, a lot of times I even check emails in the, in the evening, not always, but I should be able to get back to you fairly shortly. Okay, so today I wanted to start off, we're going to do some problems today. And um, before we do that, I, I want to kind of cover a couple issues. One's kind of a new issue, the other one will be a little bit of review. Um, the one is an accounting practice that some of you are likely familiar with called Mark to Market. Mark to Market. <laughs> All right, so mark to market accounting. All right, so this is standard accounting practice since uh, 1993 is when this passed. So it's been around for a while. And do any of you upper level accounting people, can you tell me what it is? Look at a couple of you, but I can look to any of you. Did you guys talk about that in other classes? Yeah, it is fair, it's fair value accounting. And so what's the idea of it? You're right. In terms of assets and liabilities, what are you trying to do if your mark to market is kind of the, the, the word that we use? And it does deal with fair value. What is it doing? Yeah, Eric? Uh, maybe put it on your balance sheet as with the fair market value. Yeah, and it's the the fair value as of of what? Like how are we determining fair value? Because that, that's kind of a kind of a fuzzy word to some degree, Zach. Fair value at the purchase. Yeah, at the at at the purchase or at the time. So like, okay, you're bringing up something that maybe I'm not sure you're saying the right thing, but I, I felt like you were saying the right thing. If you bought, and said, if you bought a house, um, you're, you have a rental portfolio, right? You bought a duplex five years ago for 120000 Would you be following mark-to-market -market or fair value accounting if five years from now, you still have it on your balance sheet at 120000 No, so it's not at the time of purchase. What are we valuing it at? At the date of the financial statement, that's right. So at the date, so if you value your financial statement, if we're doing one today on uh, February, what is it, 15th? February 15th, 2017, the value that you put on your, your little T statement here of assets and liabilities, the value needs to be today's value. Like what is it worth today if I, if I sold it? Now that can be a loaded question um, for different types of assets. And that's where this issue comes up here in the mark to market accounting. All right, so if we look at uh, the banker here. So here's our banker. And we look at their assets. And they've got bonds of seven million and stocks of five million, and maybe they've been a little creative here in the last few years. They've got some mortgage-backed securities of ten million, and then we've got, in contrast, maybe the owner of a business, some sort of business owner out there. Uh, let, let's say you've got a toy store, and we start listing out the toy store's assets. What are they? You run a toy store, like a inventory. inventory is the main thing, right? So we've got some games uh, in the game category, about a million dollars worth of games. We've got dolls, uh, 500,000. We've got Legos, uh, 500,000, and the list goes on and on, right? So we've got $2 million worth of assets, and there could be some real estate in there or whatnot, too. 
And then we've got hopefully an account with some money, so more liquid stuff. So dolls aren't very liquid, but cash is, right? So cash and checking accounts of uh, 500,000. So we've got 2.5 million worth of assets total at the toy store. All right, so um, if the market takes a, a tumble and uh, a big tumble, more of a stumble maybe than a tumble, uh, a big stumble like the financial crisis, and we start to have this stuff uh, being discounted and Wall Street freezes up and there's really no market for it. So you go on the market October, November, let's go November just to be safe, November of 2008, and you're like, hey, I got some mortgage-backed securities for sale. Who wants them? How many buyers are there? Zero. What are they worth? Potentially zero on a mark-to-market -market accounting, right? So there is no buyer for that particular security that day. So if you're being fair with it, that day it's probably worth zero. Now, is the intrinsic value of it truly zero? No. So mortgage-backed security means that there's a group of mortgages where people are paying real money when they pay their mortgage off. The only way that's intrinsically worth zero is if they all defaulted, right? So only a fraction of those securities are going to default, maybe due to the times and the economy being bad, we're up to 40% defaulting or 45% defaulting. But the real value of that mortgage-backed security is not zero. But if you actually tried to sell it today, you couldn't sell it. So mark-to-market accounting says maybe that should be marked down to zero or at least close to zero if we really had to fire sale. So that's where the issue comes in, is if these start getting marked down drastically to fire sale prices, um, so if this gets cut in half to five million, and, and uh, let's see what I do here. I kind of screwed up this, that's right. Oh, I didn't totally, good, perfect. What's my total here? 15, 22 million, I'll just change a little bit of what I did here. So we got $22 million of assets. Uh, this gets knocked down to $3 million, and this one gets down to $5 million. Then we've got $13 million is the mark-to-market value of the assets. <laughs> but is it an actual loss? From a profit and loss standpoint, what needs to be done, this is where if you haven't had a lot of accounting classes, your principal's class has covered this, but it seems like you guys never quite pull out all of you anyway, pull out all the information that you need from those basic accounting classes. So we're talking balance sheet item here. What's a profit and loss statement? How does it differ? What do you need to incur a loss? What has to happen with these assets? You have to actually sell them, that's right, right? So you have to have a, a, a sale to recognize that loss. So maybe some of these dolls have to be discounted too if we were to do fair value. But the business, so maybe the, from the uh, balance sheet perspective, our dolls are only worth 300,000 if I had to sell them today. But is the business owner in a position where they have to fire sale today? No. So they're just gonna keep the dolls in inventory and hopefully two to three months later when the market rebounds, they're going to sell the dolls. And so if the market eventually rebounds up to, uh, back up to, let's just say close, $450,000 worth of dolls, now there might be a loss, but the loss is only $50,000, not $200,000, right? Because the owner was able to hold off on the sale. So same thing with, the, I'm not doing this in the balance sheet here with uh, loans and owner's equity. But the point is that the business owner has the opportunity to just wait it out. They can just hold out until the market returns. The banker over here can't do that due to financial regulation. 
So when the values drop here, if they start to fall below the capital requirements that are set up by financial regulations, the owners have to come up with cash and inject that to keep it balanced or whatever the minimum threshold is. So the owner actually has to inject $100,000 or a million dollars or whatever into the system to rebalance the, the books. This guy over here doesn't have to dip into his own pocket at all. He can just ride it out. I'm just gonna wait till the market returns. I didn't have to put in any money to satisfy anything. Not maybe completely true, it's possible. This is how we get it. That's in general how it's true. During the financial crisis, if the assets were knocked down and it seemed to be persisting, if this guy had a loan with the bank or a line of credit with the bank, the bank might say, hey, we can't keep your line of credit open anymore. You used to have a half a million dollars with us as a line. You guys know what a line of credit is? You don't actually have the loan outstanding, but you have the opportunity to draw on it. Banker over here, especially when Mr. Baker's in trouble, can't keep that open liability to you, that open line of credit, because on, on the banker's balance sheet, they have to account for that. And so they're going to call you up and say, hey, sorry, uh, we're going to have to reduce your line of credit from 500000 to 300000 right? So if this, if this guy didn't really, wasn't using the cash, well, it's like, oh, no big deal. But if he needed that cash, it might start to become a big deal because then instead of going to the line of credit, he has to go into, here, I like to get my props out, into their own wallet. Right, and inject the cash for it. They can't go borrow it because the line of credit disappeared. All right, so questions on that? Yes? <laughs> yeah, it, it falls into a special contingent liability category, and that's about the extent I can go to some of you accounting majors if you've gone through that. But there is a, uh, it's like a contingent liability, and then it, sometimes it's a note on a financial statement. So they might have the balance sheet calculated with all the numbers, and then there's gonna be a series of notes. And one of those notes might say, we've got X amount of million dollars out on lines of credit or something that aren't drawn yet. Our, we've got 10 million in lines of credit, and currently we're at 7 million drawn out, right? So we've got this $3 million potential. It's technically not on our books yet, but they'll add that as a footnote to the financial statements. Okay? Anything else there? All right, so let me put the key here. Key point is when losses are realized. So key point, uh, loss is realized if, I'm sorry, loss is not realized Loss is not realized, in fact, it's not technically a loss. That's what I struggle with that. Loss is not realized uh, if assets are not sold. However, mark to market accounting forces bank owners to add capital if under <coughs> uh, benchmarks. <coughs> Okay, so um, got a couple benchmarks. What are the capital requirement benchmarks? So one is called the leverage ratio. And 
and the leverage ratio is the amount of capital divided by total assets. Capital divided by total assets. <coughs> so greater than 5% a bank is well capitalized. You get a gold star as a banker in terms of your capital requirement if this number turns out to be greater than 5%. So if we're in the uh, less than 3% in big trouble. So less than 3% triggers restrictions. Can't do a loan. Can't, you know, they're gonna they're gonna start uh, forcing you to unwind some of your assets, call in some of your loans. Okay, so then we got this gray area, three to five, you better start coming up with some plans. Three to five percent need some plans to make it better. So you're probably not going to trigger the authorities uh, getting in too deep into your business, but they're going to say, okay, what's going on here? Uh, what, how are we going to work our way out of this? And you need to provide a plan of how that capital ratio is going to Okay, questions on that? Number two is what we talked about already, um, the risk-based risk -based capital requirements. So notice when you take this simple ratio, it doesn't really address what these assets are. Who do you got the money loaned out to? Is it some crazy business person that's got this wild idea of how they're gonna solve the world's problems? Or is it to a Fortune 500 company that's um, pretty fat with cash and it's just kind of a simple commercial deal? This doesn't say anything about that, right? So this next level is the, the stuff we saw in the video on with the Basel requirements and camel. So we've got the CAMEL requirements that we listed before, and further, the Basel Accord. And your textbook has some uh, things in there that are similar to the video I showed you. We had about a 10 minute video in class on uh, Basel three, and then some other stuff that we looked at. Okay, questions on that? Do some problems. So if you're fuzzy on what Basil was, I've got a problem to hopefully defuzz us. Paige, are you on? I see your video's not working. I didn't know if you're just uh, having troubles today. But your audio usually should work. Or not. Oh, she's offline now. Okay. Hopefully, I didn't have my video on. Nope, I was on. Okay. She was going to be traveling or something, so she might have been uh, in between. Okay, so I'll let you read through it. You guys can do it. Uh, work with your somebody next door. Everybody should have at least one partner. So let's get in groups of two to two to three. I don't want you working solo on this one, so I want some discussion.
The capital ratio, by the way, here is the leverage ratio, so they also call the capital ratio. If you put your phone, if you don't have a calculator, you can put your phone on airplane mode and pull that out. Today is calculation day. Okay, looks good. This is the ratio. close for like 30 days. 
So the loan commitment is a hard commitment from that bank that they're willing to do it. Now, little does that bank know, Kaylee, actually she should tell the banker this if she's if she's smart, but she is, because she's been in this class, is that she's going to talk to three banks, not one. And so she could get a better loan commitment from another bank that comes in, right? So now, but at least when she gets the first loan commitment, she can set into motion her suppliers and start the business going. Like she knows it's golden that she's going to, she's got the loan approved, basically. But technically, she hasn't borrowed any money yet, right? Until 30 days later when she actually signs stack of papers and she gets the hundred thousand dollars in her hand now there's a loan now there's a transaction to put on a balance sheet so that's the difference between loan commitment and actual loan okay keep going You go up to the basal rules, and what weight, what risk weight do we put on T bills? Zero. So they're they're not counted as anything. You're putting a hundred on the first one, yeah. and then you're going to add up the risk weighted value. Yeah, you can start that. It doesn't matter which way you start it, but yeah, 50 million gets 100% weight. And then the, the less risky stuff gets lesser weights. Thank <laughs> you. 
I could say give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right, but you have it muted, so that's fine. I can see that. So anyway, we're just working on those problems. I think you said yes, that's fine, but your audio is a little messed up coming my direction too. So continue on. Oh, nice little balance sheets. Should just take an 8% of the 130. Yep. 
Yep, that's just gonna be the leftover. Brandon, are you working through this too? Or are you getting it? Or are you just kind of trying to follow letting Jake follow the leader? I'm trying to follow what he's doing. Okay, so what are you stuck on? Let's just talk about you and me here. Um, so you got the idea of the bank capital. Right. So we got the deposits um, being the liabilities for the bank. Right. And then the owner's capital. So we had that given to us $9 million. So that's another $9 million. Yep. So that's just always assets equal liabilities, right. which includes owner's equity. You know, sometimes you know that basic accounting equation. So we got a nine. Looks like a four to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you got 139 million here, right. and then you got the ten. Uh, you can start filling in the pieces of the puzzle of the assets. So the loans are assets to the bank. So we've got 25 in a current loan, 50 in the residential mortgage. Right? So we've got 75 total. You can do it at 75 or you can break it into 25 and 50. Yeah. And then the reserve ratio. So what's the required reserves for banking regulation? How much do they have to hold back? What's that based on? That'd be based off this. Yep. So you take eight percent of the one thirty. Yeah. That's it. So the Federal Reserve requires that they hold back ten point four million. All right. So that's required reserves. And then you just got one more thing. Whatever is left over is excess reserves. So which whatever is, gets you to 139. Yeah, that gets you to 139. And then that's going to be additional money that could be loaned out tomorrow. But right now, we were only able to get rid of 75. Okay. All right, now you've got 139, 139. You can move on to B for the capital ratio. 9 million divided by total assets. And then move into the risk. Part C gets the risk weighted business. Those of you who didn't do it. 
Uh, but the next two problems, 24 and 25, we'll see you on Friday. We'll call it a day there. So we got a uh, homework and test for this chapter is due this weekend. So homework Saturday, test Friday. I mean, test. <laughs> that would make no sense for that. Test Sunday. And uh, I did get confirmation on Monday for uh, our FDIC presentation. Janet, Janet, right? Yeah. Janet Kincaid. So <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 